The combine is on. 49ers general manager John Lynch speaks about a number of things, including his quarterbacks, gives some clues about the 49ers roster in 2023, and the Jalen Carter stuff, character concerns. And uh, let's get to the bottom of that and what it could mean for not only the NFL, but maybe even the San Francisco 49ers. Coming up on this episode of Locked On 49ers. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers. Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker with you at BD Peacock at Eric underscore Crocker. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's combine time, Croc, and pretty soon they'll finally get on the on the field and start running. We'll start getting some measurements on Thursday with the defensive linemen and the linebackers, and then it'll be the rest of the they, – they changed it up too, by the way. It used to be the DBs that were last, right? And now they go defense first. So they go defensive linemen and linebackers will be weighing in and doing their testing on Thursday. Then Friday it is the DBs, and then on – Saturday, it is the quarterbacks and wide receivers, and then the O-linemen go on Sunday. So we'll get a lot of information about draft prospects. The 49ers don't have a first-round pick, and um, there's a guy that might not be a first-round pick now in Jalen Carter. So I want to get to that stuff a little bit later, but we got to start with the 49ers-specific stuff. And 49ers GM John Lynch, who took the podium to speak about a number of subjects at the Combine. And I want to start with the quarterbacks, Croc, because um, probably – not anything groundbreaking, but I think you could try, and a lot of people are trying to read between the lines with some of the quotes from John Lynch. But one of the answers he gave was to the question about Brock Purdy, Trey Lance, because of their injuries, are the 49ers in the quarterback market? Do they have to add a quarterback? And basically he said, yes, uh, they, they probably do. But then he kind of went around it and made it sound like maybe they don't have to or they don't have to do anything specific and they really like the guys they have. But I mean, John Lynch isn't fooling anybody, Croc, right? I mean, they gotta add they gotta have three arms in camp. And at at present, they can only project one of the guys on their roster to be a, a an arm in camp, and that's Trey Lance. Right. So you have to go out and get a veteran. I think from that standpoint, it's uh how much do you spend on a veteran, right? Is this a guy like, you know, names that have been thrown around, you know, even by us, right? Uh, Matt Ryan, how much will he demand on the open market if he is let, indeed let go, which I think everybody is expecting to happen? Uh, you know, guys like Taylor Heineke, uh, Jacoby Brissett. Uh, gosh, I mean, there, there's a plethora of, of guys. Like Andy Dalton, you know, just all those type of guys. What will they demand as backup quarterbacks on the open market and I, I for one would love to have one of those guys because at the very least you have a guy with a ton of experience but you you definitely need to bring in a guy like that uh in this situation and then on top of that a whole nother guy as well right unless you just draft someone but i'd assume that you might go after two free agents maybe a, a brissette and then a very lower tier guy as a uh, backup as well I've been thinking it's going to be one veteran, one rookie. And then yeah. the sliding scale is how much they spend on the veteran. Uh, and, and that'll clue us into what they're going to spend on the rookie. So if they spend some money on a Brissette or a Matt Ryan or Marcus Mariota or whoever it is and give a decent a chunk of change to a backup quarterback, then, you know, there's an undrafted free agent they'll bring in and he'll be a camp arm and maybe makes the practice squad at best kind of thing. Once Purdy's ready to go. Uh, or if they go cheap and they go Nick Mullins or Nate Sudfeld on the free agent market, maybe that opens things up for the 49ers to draft a quarterback in the, you know, probably not the third round, but, you know, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round, something like that. Someone that might uh, think about keeping for a while and someone that could actually compete and, you know, perhaps like Brock Purdy did, knock Nate Sudfeld off the roster again once the season comes around. So that's the way I look at it. One rookie, one veteran, and then they'll tell us what they think about they'll tell us what their plan is with the rookie quarterback by what kind of veteran they sign. That's I could be completely wrong, but that's the way I'm looking at it right now. I like the thoughts of Nate Sudfield, you know, and, and that's a guy who obviously is going to come in. He knows the scheme. He knows what Kyle is expecting. I would assume that the 49ers, when they let him go, they had the intentions of being able to bring him back on the practice squad. Unfortunately, I think it was the D Detroit lions who picked him up. So that's a guy you come in. I thought he looked good. 
throughout camp. I thought he threw the ball very well. Uh, nice, tight spiral, pretty, very consistently. I thought in preseason he made some really good throws, had some really good games as well. It was somewhat of a shocker to me that they kept Brock Purdy over Sudfield. I think for some people they were like, oh, no, it was going to be him. But when I was there, and I'm not going to act like I was there the entire training camp, but Sudfield threw the ball very well. And I, I didn't even think that, uh, like anything of what I saw from Purdy uh, in the sense of them keeping Purdy over Sudfield. So um, obviously Purdy must have had much uh, more consistent days than what I had seen. But I say all that to say Nate Sudfield to me was not this terrible quarterback. I thought he'd be really more of an ideal backup quarterback for the 49ers. So he might be first on their list of guys to bring back. When speaking of young Brock Purdy and his elbow injury, Lynch's quote was, I really want to thank Dr. Meester. He called me when he made the decision. That's a tough decision to make, but I really appreciate the courage and the conviction to make that decision. Talking about Brock Purdy, that's all about the best outcome. Is it ideal? No, for a variety of reasons. Uh, time, number one, you want every waking minute that you have, but ultimately he's 22 years old. We want the best outcome, and that's why Dr. Meester made a really tough decision, and we're really appreciative. So talking about why the timeline is a little bit slow and a little bit off, and and basically the, the doctor's... Like, look, the, the the most important thing is the ultimate end outcome for, for Brock Purdy and rushing him into some procedure just to get him back at a time frame that puts him ready for camp might not be the best thing for his elbow and his long-term career. So um, that's where we're at with Brock Purdy. And uh, basically, uh, uh, Dr. Meester is going to go to spring training because he's normally a baseball doctor. He's going to go to spring training, and that's where – Brock Purdy lives and they'll meet again. And so at some point, hopefully this month, we'll get a, a timetable, a new updated timetable, and we'll get a, a surgery date and and then we'll we'll have some results and we'll have a, a clear picture of what the recovery is going to look like for Brock Purdy post surgery. It feels like everyone is very confident that he'll be ready to go week one and step uh, right in. It's, especially the organization. It was like, I, I don't know. This is I, I wonder, and this has been thrown out there because there was, you know, this prolonged swelling. Do you think the 49ers potentially did more damage to Brock Purdy by letting him continue to throw in that game when he was already injured? A lot of times with things like that, once the damage is done, it's kind of done. Like, I don't know if you have to get it repaired. Are you actually making it worse of a repair? You know, it's like an ACL. I, I remember my, my guy, uh, Kendall Porter. Shout out to my guy, Kendall Porter. Kendall Porter tore his ACL. We had no idea. He was still able to like run around. I don't, it was really weird, right? Some people, I don't know, their, their reaction to these injuries is different. Mm -hmm. But he was going to get the ACL repair surgery regardless. <laughs> you know, I don't know if he could have just made it worse. It was like your ACL is torn. You have to get surgery. So as far as this injury, and I don't know much about it, but I was talking to a parent out here yesterday. You know, I train athletes and two baseball kids out here, same elbow injury. They tore their, their uh, UCL. Yeah, their UCL. Wow. That, that same elbow thing. All right, they're, but having, they're having Tommy John? I don't know if they're having Tommy John, but they definitely oh. have to get surgery. Wow. Two of the kids. So, um, but I still have to say, we'll see ultimately what the timetable is. I think for you, my question is, do you think, because we've been talking about how this kind of affects Trey Lance or, you know, whatever, right? You know, the, everybody's behind Brock Purdy. He's kind of the guy. You hear his teammates talk about him. They're very excited. You hear the fans talk about him. They're excited. You hear the front office talk about him. They're excited, right? So it's kind of like, okay, Brock Purdy's the guy. Is there a chance that Brock Purdy starts off on the PUP list? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And in fact, I think, well, if, if he's going to – the the whole th the that that period between three and six months, if it is the six month surgery, that's the part where it's unclear what kind of work he can do and where he can do it. Because if they want him involved in any portion of practice, he's not going to be on any PUP list or anything like that. But if they want the roster spot and they want to start him on the PUP list because he's not going to be involved in practices and he would still be able to do whatever on the side, then you know he'll be on that list until they want to activate him. So that's what's unclear to me is what he'll be able to do if he can do some drills and not some others and, and sort of still be a part of the offseason program and especially training camp after the three-month period when he starts throwing, even if it's before he's fully cleared at the six-month mark. Now, obviously, that opens up a whole different 
can of worms, <laughs> right? Yep. Because if that is indeed the case, and Trey Lance goes out there, and let's say, hypothetically speaking, because one, we've never even seen Trey Lance start, uh, play two full back-to-back games, right? So right. we don't even know what that looks like. But let's say he goes out there, and all of a sudden, for first four games, while Purdy's on the pup list, and Purdy's the guy, he's the starting quarterback, but then Lance wins three out of four games. And it's like, hey, he's playing well. I mean, what what do you, what do, you do? It's so hard. And, yeah, is Purdy able to m- make the team comfortable enough just from what they see with him throwing and just, you know, going through meetings and stuff and, you know, doing the chalkboard work? Um Will they be able to tell? Oh yeah, okay. So we're we'll, we're still good with Purdy, and once he's cleared, we we feel good about plugging him in. And then it's like a then it's like okay, well, is Trey better than that, or is he not as good as that? And then that'll make their decision. But just going straight in blind, I mean, like okay, let's base it off what we saw from Purdy last year. That's what makes it really difficult. And and I have no idea how any of that's going to go. And and who knows what other veterans in camp as well, and, and putting pressure on these guys. So it's going to be fascinating. And uh, we still don't have a timeline for. Brock Purdy updated post surgery, and hopefully this month. Well, we have a timeline. We know it's six months. We just don't know six well, months from when. <laughs> you know? Six months from, uh, you know, Tommy John, the end of Tommy John surgery too, which makes. Oh it yeah, yeah. Well, so who knows what what's going to look like when they open up that elbow? And it's, to me, it's a little. How long they're they're waiting for this? It tells me there's there's potential for a lot in in like the. I, I just. It, it's so I've never heard of a surgery for an NFL player that had to take this long after he injured himself to perform the surgery. I've, I've I, never heard of it. Maybe I'm just not paying close enough attention. I hate it for Purdy. You know, well, I hate it for Shanahan because he just wants a starting quarterback. But I, I hate it for Purdy as well because the player element of it, you know, just you're, you're the last pick in the draft. You start off really the fourth string quarterback or whatever it is. Then you you bump your way up and and then you play and you play extremely well and you earn the respect of all your teammates. And then this injury happens and really derails everything. And I just think of, you know, all the shots cutting to his parents, to his dad, his dad getting emotional in games, you know, stepping on the field with Tom Brady and, you know, what that looked like and just those, those moments. And all of a sudden now it's like, there's this injury, and 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 I'm not. I don't know what's gonna happen with Trey Lance, but if Trey Lance goes out there and plays well, it's like, dang, do I just go back to the bench? You you know, and it's just like because I got hit in the elbow, like that sucks. You know, yeah, that for for him, I'm talking about like him specifically in his situation. This is an the, an, an underdog story, and everybody loves it, and and it's it's been amazing, uh, and it's been like almost unbelievable. And I got hit, and now it could really kind of derail everything. Unless Lance just bombs it, which I'm not gonna lie, I don't think Lance is gonna bomb it. I just think he needs to play multiple games in a row. <laughs> right? Yeah, he just needs to play uh, more on Trey Lance. John Lynch's quotes on Lance, uh, Tashawn Gibson, Brian Greasy, and so much more. And what's going on with Jalen Carter and the 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 huge news of the week so far from the NFL scouting combine? Next, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Of course, you can still bet on NFL football, even though the season is over. You can bet on future Super Bowl champions. You can bet on super f- future uh, MVPs of the NFL. And, of course, tons of NFL draft props as well at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And now we are beyond the trade deadline, beyond the All-Star game, and getting serious in the NBA season. So now's the perfect time to download FanDuel. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back when your first bet doesn't win so that no sweat first bet make sure you sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on for up to one thousand dollars back if your first bet doesn't win bet on anything money line point scores three pointers drained uh love the sports book the fanduel sports book app too safe secure super easy to use and if you want to combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout check out the same game parlays don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets back when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more make every moment more with fanduel an official sports betting partner of the nba so when it comes to trey lance john lynch said this quote i'm watching trey out there taking drops each day 
uh, talking about how, Lynch always loves to talk about how he's in his office and sees people out on the practice field. He's got That's that a pretty thing. sweet kind of setup, right? Yeah, it does sound kind of awesome. You kind of got that going on with your new facility, Croc. I, I, I do. Not to the same extent, right? Now, I'm not watching Trey Lance drop back, but you know, I got some little kids over here. You know, they're out there slinging it. I get to watch from uh, up top. By the way, if you're anywhere near Monticello, Arkansas, send your kids to Coach Croc to, uh, to get a serious workout, some serious training. Some future athletes coming out of Monticello, I have a feeling, in the near future that we're going to see. Maybe in the NFL draft, maybe a future combine's coming up soon. But uh, hey, real quick, we yeah. are talking about you know Trey Lance, 49ers, and I have an I I have a kind of a a better understanding of kind of the situation with the 49ers based on what I'm going through coaching 707 here in Southeast Arkansas, and my kids are the kids in this area are so far behind. And the only reason why I know it is because you know well I'm coming from California. Dude's been having, you know, private trainers, sports performance trainers, position specific trainers, NFL guys at their disposal, right, that they work with. And you kind of come to an area like this that's kind of deprived of that. And there's a huge difference. There's a gap just in the development and where you have to start, like from the very, very basics. And I wonder if that's how Kyle has felt about kind of the land situation where it's like, man, like I have to teach this guy everything. I don't got time to teach. So um, I just wanted to throw that in there. But 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 go ahead. Uh, so uh, John Lynch talking about Trey Lance and, and watching him out on the practice field said, I don't see a limp. It's not to say he's 100 percent, but he's really recovering well and doing a really nice job. He did start throwing here recently. Trey's rehabbing really well. He did have that secondary procedure. It wasn't really a setback. One of the plates was kind of giving him interference with some of the tendons, but they took care of it. He seems to be doing really well, and we're really happy for him. And he went on to talk about how Trey Lance needs to needs to stay healthy. And um, just w w when you hear the, the way the team talks about Purdy, the way the team talks about Lance, whether it's Lynch or Shanahan or some of the players, and you remember you go back to – some of the practices from Trey Lance's rookie year when he's running the scout team and Fred Warner and, and D'Amico Ryans have talked about how, you know, he's was, they, they, he, they wanted to, him to just let it fly during practice. Right. And he was, a, he was a little tentative there and, and Brock Purdy was kind of the opposite as a rookie. And when you read between the lines, it, it does seem like Trey Lance really has to play catch up to how the team feels about Brock Purdy. And he has the opportunity this spring and summer with Purdy being out, but it does feel like there's a, a sizable gap, like a, I don't know how big the gap is, but just the way that everyone talks about them, just the feel that you get, nobody's really said anything exact about it, except for a couple of quotes here. I think probably the, the biggest one is the, the quote from, uh, I think it was at the Super Bowl, the quote from George Kittle, where he's like, basically is Brock Purdy's job to lose. It's, it's the way it feels. So Trey Lance is definitely playing catch up this off season, And there's no NFL games for him to play to win that job. Unless Brock Purdy can't start the season. I think the gap is a four year gap, right? Like the, the or three year difference, right? That the three years of start or four years of starting experience or three and a half, whatever, for Brock Purdy, as opposed to the one in college for Trey mm -hmm. Lance. And again, now that I'm in this situation, I'm working with these kids and I have one quarterback who has, you know, he's he's playing in central Arkansas over near uh, in Benton near Little Rock. And they throw the ball a lot more. They spread it out. They throw the ball a lot more. We we'll have a younger kid who they don't throw it as much. They run more power offense. And just kind of what the difference is, which is how they see the field and just their reps and how comfortable one feels more than the other and throwing certain passes and like just kind of how sure of it they are. And the only way that I'm going to get my younger guy better is by getting them reps. So I figure out different ways to get them reps. Uh, I'm taking them to an all 15 U tournament so he can get more reps because there is that catch up that he has to do with my guy that's from central Arkansas. So I think when it comes to Trey Lance and, and, and uh, Brock Purdy, it's not a, it's not a, a, a talent gap. It's not an ability gap, right? Because if you just watch a Trey Lance highlight, right? Like just type in Trey Lance 49 on highlights and what that looks like, there is no talent gap, right? But there is a sizable experience gap from just how to handle yourself and being a backup, right? Um, understanding how to practice, going through those different scenarios, uh, the, the games and, you know, playing live speed, messing up. Trey never messed up at North Dakota State. He threw 28 touchdowns, zero interceptions as a redshirt freshman, right? Uh, and ran for a bunch more touchdowns. So it's like he never lost, never lost a game. So there's not even the experience of how do I handle a loss? 
How do I deal with this? How do I deal with bouncing back from an interception, right? Like all these things that go in. When we think of experience, we just think of playing and throwing. But it's also scenarios as well. So it could be a scenario as, hey, just understanding how to practice as a backup. And Trey not having that experience because, you know, and having to figure it out. And Brock Purdy's like, hey, I come here. I know exactly what to do. I'm just going to wing it and, tell, and do what you guys tell me to do. And also not have the pressure of being the third overall pick where people are expecting you to be a certain type of way. And hey, I was last pick in the draft, kind of playing with house money a little bit. Their scenarios are so much different. And I think that has created the gap for one guy that was more prepared to just step on the field because of it. And, and I think another aspect of the Trey Lance thing, his transition from college to the NFL that, that not enough people talk about is the talent that was on Trey Lance's team. They were talking about a one double A team that went undefeated and won the championship. And there's been like half a dozen guys now. There's going to be two more guys drafted from that 2019 team. One of them wasn't a starter. Offensive lineman Cody Mock might go in the top 50 picks this year. The fullback, uh, Loop Key, is going to get drafted this year. Christian Watson, um, Cordell Volson, and uh, who's the other? Dylan Radens, the other, the other offensive lineman. I mean, those guys all came from the offense that Trey Lance was operating. Like the, the other teams they're playing against in 1AA – Maybe if they're lucky, they would have had sniffed a late round NFL draft pick, like one on the entire roster. Trey Lance was playing with half a dozen NFL guys, and we've seen like Tua, Mac Jones, and what it looks like when you're playing for Alabama, right? But you're playing other SEC teams. This is Trey Lance's talent with some of these NFL players on his offensive line that he's throwing to that looks like a star, right? Christian Watson looked awesome as a rookie for the Green Bay Packers. I mean, just the talent gap that, that Trey Lance and the, the North Dakota State Bison had versus their teams, I think you're you, when you make the jump to the NFL, I think that's difficult. The speed of the game is difficult. You've seen how it's like he, he, he looked so efficient operating his offense in college, and he gets to the NFL, and it does look a little sluggish. He looks like he, he's not quite ready to rip that first read, and it doesn't come out as quick, and it doesn't look as natural and, and as easy, and you would expect that from most rookies. But I think a lot of um, – the, the step up in, in in competition from 1AA to the NFL, playing against the 49ers stud defense in practice, you know, I'm sure that was just wild for him the first day of practice, seeing Fred Warner run around at linebacker versus what he was going against at North Dakota State when his guys were so much better than the other team's guys. Right. And, and again, my the only, I don't want to say pushback, but again, if you – for some guys, right, just that huge jump would be such an issue. And all of a sudden, a guy that is very talented at that level, you'd say, well, he's not as talented at the NFL level. And I think that might be the case with them saying they kind of overrated or overvalued his ability to run, which I think he's kind of, I think he has ran well, but not as a like a pure design runner getting outside, mm -hmm. you know. But um, again, if you just, if you look at his highlight and he, Listen, guys, I know the comments are going to come. Well, you can't go off highlights. What, what's consistent? I get it. But what I'm saying is just when you watch his highlights for the 49ers, that does not look like somebody that can't play in the NFL. The, the issue is inconsistency, right? So some of these highlights, you see these really good plays, special throws, you know, darts, whatever. Maybe a run where he picks up 10 yards on third down. But then there's two runs where – they're designed runs or read options and he picks up one yard and then there's a missed throw, right? And, and those things. So it's not a, it's, it's, again, I go back because sometimes you draft a guy, let's say Solomon Thomas and you over value or overrate his ability to be just that talented player. He was at Stanford in the NFL. And it's just like, well, he's just not that caliber. Player. Like Trey Lance has showed you all the ability to, to be that guy, like all the throws, even in, in the rain against the Chicago Bears, where you were like, man, that was a throw. Man, that was a throw downfield. Man, picked up first down on third or 13, right? Like, you've seen it. The consistency isn't there. So, like, my thing and yours as well, like, well, he just has to play. And I would assume that that would lead. They don't have that time, though. And that's, that's, the, that's the issue. And that's yeah. where when we talk about that gap, kind of closing or how big of a gap it is, Brock Purdy is ready to go right now. Like, he's ready to play a, f a brand of football you can win with, as well as make some off-scripted plays as well, and then the leadership ability, right? Like, that he's just learned over starting for three and a half years and having to be that guy, right? There, like, there's just so many things that he has just learned.
and Trey Lance is trying to play catch up. You talk about the gap right now for the 49ers, just the mental gap. That's huge. Next, some interesting nuggets from John Lynch about the coaching staff. Uh, some listeners out there might need to start get their resumes ready for one of the jobs that is open. A uh, clue to who might be coming back on the 49ers defense and free agency. I want to talk a little bit about the Jalen Carter bombshell news coming from the combine as well coming up. Thanks again, everybody for making locked on 49ers. Your first listen on the locked on podcast network, your team every day Uh, for your second listen, check out the new locked on NFL draft. Make sure you're checking out the Peacock and Williamson show every single day. Myself and former NFL scout, Matt Williamson talk about the entire league and we've got a brand new YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash at Peacock and Williamson to find it. Make sure you are subscribed up there. So the 49ers are looking for the new boombox guy, Croc. I don't know if you uh, are interested in it, but John Lynch, I don't know if he's joking or serious, said they're taking applications. I don't know <laughs> in jobs for the boombox guy, but if you are um, probably have to help out in some other ways as well to the football team, but if you can carry a boombox and not get your eardrums blown out, then – you might be the guy to hold the boom box, but for seriousness, real, here, real quick, no, that I'm I've been boom. tagged a few times. People have at like, and they're probably joking as well. But the answer is no. That boom box is heavy. Yeah, all right. I mean, uh, when I coached at Edison High, shout out to Edison High, Stockton, California. My guy Lavelle Hawkins. All right, Lavelle uh, was with the Niners for a little bit. Uh, played seven years in the NFL, Tennessee Titans. Went to Cal Berkeley, all that good stuff, right? But Lavelle got the idea from the Niners. Hey man, we're going to come out with the boom box, right? With the bump box, all right? Shout out to Stockton, California with the bump box, the founders there. But we came out with the bump box. Our guys come through. They got the rap music playing. Uh, NBA young boy, you know, some of the younger crowd, they know who that is. And I carried it one time. That thing is heavy. Ne- never again. I made the player, like somebody else has to carry that thing. So that's all the way out. I mean, if anybody follows Croc at Croc Time U on on Instagram and sees your workout videos, they know you're not carrying the boombox. <laughs> now, Croc's been doing well. Croc's been hitting it hard. A lot of sweat. Um, uh, Brian Greasy is coming back. I, I, we, we had really never heard either way if Brian Greasy was going to stick around for the 49ers. He's going to come back as quarterback's coach for the 49ers. If Brian Greasy wants to make a career of it, um, I think the 49ers might next year have a, a difficult opportunity holding on to him or might have to give him a bump or a different – title because uh he could be a fast riser in the nfl so that's good news for the was he a one-year contract i don't know i there was just some speculation that maybe he would go back to the booth after one year like maybe trying it out and maybe if he didn't like coaching or something i don't know where it came from i I didn't expect that he would want to leave if he made the leap to if he if he wanted to coach that badly but um i think there was just some speculation about it and so lynch was asked about it and he said that brian greasy was coming back um also said that um, – here's an interesting one. So he said that Tishon Gibson was expected – that he wanted to continue playing. How would John Lynch know that Tishon Gibson wanted to keep playing if he hasn't been in contact with him or his agent? So it sounds to me like they're trying to resign Tishon Gibson or else John Lynch wouldn't know that, right? If we're reading between the lines here, Croc? Right. And also, I mean, maybe he saw what Gibson said about Talano Hufanga. But no, you have your exit meetings. And and I'm not sure how many of y'all have played sports out there or professional sports or even collegiate sports because you do it, but you have your exit meetings at the end of the season just to kind of know where you are. And it's just an open conversation with the coach. And I'm pretty sure in that meeting, he said, hey, you know, I I don't think I'm hanging it up. I would like to be back. You know, if I'm going to come back, it's going to be with Talano Hufunga. And they probably had some sort of a uh, conversation to know where he was at before he uh, headed out, cleaned out his locker. And if Gibson's back, probably less likely that Jimmy Ward would be coming back. That's just my speculation here. And Robbie Gold, here's an interesting quote. He Usually GMs are a little bit more, uh, they're a little more politicians about it, right? And kind of talk around answers and, and don't really give you too much information. But John Lynch, when asked about Robbie Gold, he said, we're not done with that, uh, checking out the Robbie Gold situation and, and not done uh, scouting the draft eligible kickers. He said, part of the whole Robbie situation is we got to do our work here and you want to give Robbie as much time to pivot as possible, but we have to do our evaluations here. So they're very, very much in evaluating potential replacement kickers. He admitted that. 
And he also said very much in the picture to re-sign Gold. Very much in the picture. It just it came off a little bit like it seemed unlikely that the 49ers were going to re-sign Robbie Gold after hearing John Lips speak. Well, we've talked about salary cap, and I would love to have him on there. I've kind of been the probably the fan club leader, right? Like I'm driving the bus, uh, bringing Robbie Gold back. I feel so confident anytime he steps on the field. But also with that, you know, we talked about that and discussed it because of the financial ramifications. And you talked about how the 49ers, even though they don't have the highest paid quarterback, they still are going to have, I mean, the Nick Bosa contract, what that looks like. Fred Warner, at when he signed, he was the highest paid linebacker. Trent Williams, when he signed, he was the highest paid tackle. Debo Samuel, he's making a ton of money. I mean, there, there's guys all over the field that they are paying a lot of money to. Uh, Traveris Ward, if he's in his, hitting his incentives, like he's making good money. Are you bringing back Emmanuel Mosley? So I could see a scenario where if you're like, hey, we want to save five, six million dollars in an area and maybe draft somebody later, as opposed to bringing back Robbie Gold, then you know he's maybe one of the guys that you sacrifice. The Jalen Carter news is kind of wild, Croc. And anybody who doesn't know about it, um, basically he's got a warrant out for his arrest, is expected to be somewhere between the first and the fourth pick at the latest in the NFL draft this year. Now that is up in the air. Um, uh, one of the, our listeners, Croc, tagged us on Twitter and asked us, what if... Jalen Carter falls to the 49ers in the third <laughs> round, right? If he slides that far. And to me, that's an easy answer because if this, if the scenario is that serious for Jalen Carter, that he slides to where the 49ers are selecting a pick 99 overall, it's probably an indicator. The 49ers aren't going to take him either. Right. Cause that means something serious is going on, right. uh, but it's just hard to know when you hear these anonymous, you know, character concerns for some prospects and, and that could be any number of things. It could be real serious. It could be not that serious. Um, you could just be a knucklehead. You could be young, you could be immature. So I don't really know what to expect about this, but it could be a very bad situation. And hopefully it's just, it's not. And it's just a guy who made a mistake. I wonder when, when it comes to the whole like character concerns, because that is thrown out a lot. I think when it was initially thrown out by Todd McShay, I believe it was. Yeah. He got a lot of pushback. People were yeah. like, Oh, you guys always do this, you know, to these black, you know, athletes and whatnot. Th that was before this incident that took place that he actually has a warrant out yeah. for. And he also was driving reckless speeding he, earlier. Yeah, he got a he got a speeding ticket apparently in September. And then there was the character concern stuff that McShay talked about. That was around December where he, he mentioned that. And then this in new incident with reckless driving where he was supposedly – racing somebody else from the team 2 30 a.m after they were in downtown athens georgia and the other car crashed and uh his a teammate and one of the coaches that was in there a trainer is a is a female like a like a tr trainer on staff trainer. okay so, so, so yeah somebody from the staff um and they died in that crash and and jalen carter was in the other car and he fled the scene and so i don't know all the details about it and, and you can go look it up a little bit more but it, it could be any it could be anywhere on the spectrum from knucklehead it's going too fast. Like we probably all have done when we're around the age 21 or younger, right. Um, to very bad, you know, drinking and driving and this is a deadly situation. Right. And, and, and so he could be in a lot of hot water with the law. He could be in a lot of hot water uh, because he misled the police in this investigation, uh, fle fleeing the scene. Uh, was there evidence that he was drinking and driving as well? If they go back and, and look at video or, you know, talk to people from the bars that, that were out that night before he was driving. Um, and with the Henry rug situation, the league doesn't even need the law to, to come down on him and they could do their own punishment. So this is really up in the air with the draft status for, uh, for, for Jalen Carter. And, um, it's going to be it's going to be wild to see how teams treat this situation. Croc left the chat. He's gone. I don't know where he went. Um, but this is wild. And yeah, to answer the question from one of our listeners and sorry, I didn't save the tweet. But basically, the question was, if Jalen Carter, you know, slides all the way down to the 49ers in the third round. Well, of course, talent wise, the 49ers would be smart to draft a player like that. But uh, if you're talking about availability, that's the biggest issue. And we've seen that multiple times with the 49ers. I don't think they would have any part of somebody that's that talented. And if there was big enough reasons for him to fall to the third round, I don't think he would end up a San Francisco 49er 
either. And, and, you know, it might be a Lyle Collins situation. Remember from a few years ago, he ended up being, you know, supposed to be a first round guy, ended up going undrafted. There was the Laramie Tunsil stuff that that was clearly, you know, his ex-girlfriend or whatever it was, put it out there on draft day and teams just were scrambling, didn't know what to do. He was still a first round pick, still been one of the best offensive tackles in the league. Um, Tyron Matthew, there was character concerns with him coming out of LSU and he fell to the third round. He was clearly a first round talent and all that was behind him. And he's been, you know, model citizen in the NFL and a really good player. Um, the 49ers have gone through stuff with Ruben Foster, who fell to the end. Like he was a top 10 talent in that draft and fell to the end of the first round where the 49ers went and got him. And it turned out to burn them. And and he turned out to to, to not be available for the 49ers when they needed him. Um there was the Joe Williams stuff for very different and like all these quote unquote character concerns. They're, they're, they're very, they're all very different and very individual. You know, some people were committed crimes and some people were just knuckleheads when they were young, you know, and young and in college. Um, but Joe Williams potentially just didn't, you know, that he was, he was flagged and the 49ers didn't even have him on their draft board because they weren't sure they could, they could trust the kind of player he was going to be. But Kyle Shanahan liked him and they drafted Joe Williams and, Guess what? He was unavailable for him. So I think availability is probably the biggest thing that the 49ers have been burned by with both Ruben Foster and Joe Williams. There was, um, who was the other one, Croc, that we were talking about? Oh, Rashard Robinson, right? Yeah, Rashard Robinson. With a lot of these things, you when they say character issues or concerns, depending on what it is, like th this situation that's happening with Jalen Carter, I think it is raising a lot of eyebrows and people are concerned about it. It sounds more like a very immature very stupid decision very like and in the worst way right the, the one of the worst decisions that you can make in a situation like this when i think of character concerns i think of some of the things that i was hearing about richard robinson and you know i knew people in house <laughs> an actual player on that team that would tell me certain things and that was a lot different than this and some of the things that I've seen growing up, like when, when I think of character concerns, I think of a lot of the people that I grew up with and around and how they were. And I mean, we're talking about people shooting people, going to jail with all these pistols on them. Uh, you know, just, I mean, just the wildest things that you can imagine seeing as a young kid that, that I grew up around. When I think of character issues, it's that. N not so much a bad decision because you're maybe you're younger and don't truly understand the ramifications of the the actions, you know. Uh, so you can be a good kid or you know a good whatever or have good intentions, but make a stupid kind of decision in the sense of not knowing exactly how to handle something. Matter of fact, when I got to the NFL, they had this whole thing where they taught you how to handle situations, kind of like this, where hey, if this happens, this is who you call, this is what you do. In this situation, this is how you handle it. Um, we had this whole like decision-making life thing where it was like the simulation where I remember Geno Smith and I picked like this one female where she ended up being a stripper and then she uh, had three kids and then uh, took us, took our money uh, for child support. And you know, like, they're, they're, you know, like there's, there's those things where you just make these bad decisions. And then there's other guys who hang around with the wrong people. It, you got a lot of stuff going on. And there's some players I or I've heard like these firsthand stories that fans probably wouldn't even believe about what's really going on with some of these guys. So character concerns, it's it's a lot deeper depending on who so I would love to know what McShay, when he says character concerns, is he talking about what I think is character concerns? Or is he just talking about a very immature guy that can, right. you know, over time he'll become more mature you hope we got to go there's going to be no doubt more reports on this with jalen carter and uh you can tune into peacock and williamson for more on the entire nfl of course croc anything related to the 49ers we will have you covered here on locked on 49ers thanks everybody for making us your first listen every single day croc and i back tomorrow right here locked on 49ers you are Locked On 49ers, 